That's fantastic. My name is Frank. I'm one of the pastors. I'm glad you're here. We're in a series where we've been looking at these mentors from the Old Testament, and we've been studying their lives and particularly looking at their faith. And we've been talking about how they, they're really just normal people with mistakes and challenges and doubts, and they just are, are used by God. And sometimes they rise up to incredible faith, and other times we see them kind of falter away. And I think what happens is over the years, we begin to glorify these people. And it's not that it's, it, we shouldn't, we should learn from them, but we should also realize that what they did is impacting generations to come, including us, and what we do impacts generations to come. It's particularly hard in our culture because we're not a culture known for its patience. Delayed gratification, good things to come to those who wait in due time, just wait and see. Those aren't words of our society anymore. We're into immediate gratification. Microwave cooking, buy on credit, cause and effect, immediate results. We, we don't do patience very well. We measure our success by the immediate outcomes that we can see. That's how it's measured in our society. We expect immediate gains on our investments, immediate results from our efforts. We can't stand slow internet speeds. We can't stand any pause in streaming. Anyone who doesn't immediately answer our texts as if they're living, waiting for us to contact them. We demand self-checkout. We want 5G and not 4G, although we don't even know what the difference is. We want short sermons. We want short lines at restaurants. We want easy parking. We are in a get it now world. We really struggle today doing something that may not benefit us for years, like savings accounts. The generation that fought World War II often thought of the lives they would leave their kids and grandkids. They lived with the future in mind. That was what characterized their generation. That's why they were called, in many ways, the great generation, that entire generation that lived honestly for us. They believed they were fighting for the war to end all wars. They were willing to die so their great, great grandkids could live in peace. We rarely hear somebody today say that they're doing something so their great grandkids will have some kind of benefit. In our society, we typically don't think that far ahead. Most people only care about the world they're gonna experience during their lifetime because we're a cause and effect world. I need to see the results of what I do quickly or I'm gonna stop doing it. Often we carry those expectations into church, our relationship with God. We expect that our sacrifices will bring immediate results. If not immediate, then at least soon. And if not soon, then surely in our lifetime. I think most of us think that if we do well, if we're surrendered to Jesus, if we follow the leading of the Holy Spirit, that we'll see the fruit of our labor at some point. We'll know our effectiveness because God will bless us and reward our efforts. But the stories in the Bible show us a key truth. God is not limited by our timetable. Some of the advances that God makes through us for the kingdom are immediate and evident. But often, we may not really have an impact until generations to come. That's why I never asked God the why question. Because if he answered it, I wouldn't understand it. It would make no sense to me. God, why is this happening to me? And the answer might be, so a family in Tanzania can find Christ in 150 or 1,000 years. What? Yeah. God has things going on that we don't understand. In fact, Rick Warren says it'd be the same as trying to explain the internet to an ant. We don't get it. God's not on our timetable. He's not limited to our lifetime or our generation. He is patient, we're not. My great-great-grandfather, William Andrew Burns, was an illiterate farmer that lived near Hope, Arkansas. 
They were poor, uneducated, just scraping by. He served in the Civil War as part of Arkansas's 3rd Division. At one point, one day he got so sick that they held him back in the medical tent and his entire regiment went off to Seven Pines and they all died. None of them survived except him because he was sick. Eventually he served in the Texas Regiment, of course, and lost his leg at Gettysburg. He returned home to a destroyed rural South, Ar South Arkansas. No one in my family could read or write or had gone past second grade. Most of them could only put an X where their name went. When William returned from Civil War, essentially disabled with limited abilities, it's hard to keep a farm with one leg. William's grandson, my grandfather, went to school, planned to go through second grade and breeze through first grade and second grade and was prepared, like everybody else he'd ever know, to go back to the farm for the rest of his life. But a school teacher saw his potential. She said, this kid has potential. She went to a man in town who had some resources, and he agreed to put my grandfather through school, then through college. My grandfather became superintendent of the school system that taught him. His children, my dad, uncles, and aunts became engineers and accountants and successful businessmen and women and accomplished people and created a generation of kids. His grandkids, my cousins and I, included doctors, engineers, professors, politicians, and pastors. That man never knew the impact of the kindness and generosity that he had on our family and how it impacted our lives generations later. He had no idea that his investment in my grandfather would eventually change lives across the world, even in Tanzania. And we'll get to that later. I should be a farmer in Southern Arkansas. I think I would have had enough wisdom to go 64 miles to get to Texas. In just two generations, the entire future of our family changed because of one man's generosity. Hold on. In addition, my grandfather learned about Jesus because he could now read. Prior to my grandfather, our family were all Jehovah's Witnesses very common in rural Arkansas among the illiterate. But my grandfather surrendered to Christ when he was able to read about Jesus. One man's generosity changed the destiny and the entire eternal destiny of my family, including me. Same thing happens spiritually. Spiritual growth begins with the slow process of cultivating, planting the seed, tending the crops, and eventually reaping a harvest. The seed we throw may not produce anything for generations, and God is okay with that even if we're not. A missionary from Remnant named Cash Godbold lived for years, he and his wife, in the Sudan. He's a missionary. He attended our services when we were over at Alliance. He and his wife traveled through the Sudan in an old trailer, going through the sand, sharing the gospel with the Muslim world. It was dangerous work, but they were patient. How patient? They didn't see their first convert for 37 years. 37 years, not one convert, but they faithfully kept throwing seed. God's word never returns void. The God bowls, yeah, that's their name. They'll witness everything from heaven. We may never know the impact of what we're doing. And our evaluation of God's effectiveness, God's purposes, God's faithfulness cannot depend on outcomes that we see. We're going to look at a man again, Moses. If you remember, we left off last week. 
We've been looking at Moses for the last couple of weeks, and Moses was an incredible man. He, he worked through, in amazing ways, God worked through him. We learned last week that he was not perfect. He made some mistakes. And those mistakes clearly cost him dearly. But God remained faithful to his promises. Moses, we learned, was forbidden by God to enter into the promised land. He had taken credit for what God was doing and acted out in God's name in anger. God expects a great deal from his leaders, and Moses had missed the mark. All that work leading people who didn't want to be led, and he would not enter the land that he dreamed of, that God had promised. But Moses was special, right? I mean, surely this was just God acting out in the moment. I mean, how could Moses miss out on the promised land? It was his dream. God knew that. Surely God will have mercy on him. Did I mention we live in a culture where people rarely have to pay for their consequences? With time, punishment softens. Laws don't get enforced. Sentences are shortened. And cries for continued justice tend to fade. Surely if Moses went back to God after everything calmed down, God would reconsider and let Moses go to the promised land, right? I mean, look at his leader. He would have mercy on him, right? I hear people all the time tell me, when I get to heaven, I'm just going to talk to God. He's going to grade on a curve because I've done some good things and I'm not as bad as Hitler. And we're going to talk. He and I, we're going to have a conversation. And I know he says that I'm not going to go to heaven, but we're going to talk and he's, he's going to show mercy to me. I always want to ask him, have you read the story of Moses? Let's read it. And I pleaded with the Lord at that time saying, oh, Lord God, you have only begun to show your servant your greatness and your mighty hand. For what God is there in heaven and on earth who can do such works and mighty acts as yours? This is a great biblical begging point right here. Always good to start out by praising how God great is so great before you get to the ask part. It helps to soften him up a little bit, maybe pump up his ego, make him feel better about giving you what he wants. Here comes the ask. Please, let me go over and see the good land beyond the Jordan, that good hill country in Lebanon. Moses is on his knees. God, please let me go. He used the magic word. Who could say no to please? Do you remember when I said that God's promises are true? That what he declares will happen will happen? It works both ways. He doesn't change his mind even if you want him to. Verse 26, but the Lord was angry with me because of you and would not listen to me. And the Lord said, enough of you, do not speak to me of this matter again. You see, people think that God's not going to do what he says he's going to do about hell and punishment. Read this. Enough from you. So much for pretty please with sugar on it. But God doesn't stop there. Go up to the top of Pisgah and lift your eyes westward and northward and southward and eastward and look at it with your eyes. For you shall not go over the Jordan. Not only is it a no, it's a you go up and realize what you've lost. You go up to the top of that hill and you see what you will never be able to visit in your lifetime. Take a good look around, Moses, because this is as close as you're going to get. Hmm. Then it gets worse. But charge Joshua and encourage and strengthen him, for he shall go over at the head of this people, and he shall put them in possession of the land that you shall see. Not only do you not get to go, Moses, you're going to encourage and help Joshua fulfill your bucket list. Think about how much this moment must have tested Moses' faith. After all he'd done, after all the work he'd put in, God isn't being fair. Moses said he was sorry. 
God expects too much from me. The problem is not me. Maybe Moses could have said it's God. He's got a problem. It's so easy to go there, isn't it? Sometimes our greatest step of faith is the one we take when we're ticked off and we want to react and we choose not to. Moses is coming to the end of his life. Things aren't going as he hoped. I'm sure he imagined leading the people into the land of milk and honey, seeing God establish his earthly kingdom in a land flowing with everything. No more wandering, everyone loving and following God, no more whining, just God's greatness and God's people. They'll be his people and he'll be their God, just like God had promised. Close your eyes for a minute. Put yourself in this moment. It's hot and it's dusty. All you've ever known is dry desert land. All your parents died in this wilderness. You've heard stories of the promised land. You've been told that one day you'd go there. You've heard and seen Moses since your very first days. He speaks to God. He's led you his whole life. You're sick of wandering. You're sick of searching. You need water. You're hungry for real food. You're longing to settle down in this land, this paradise that you've heard so much about. And the time has come and everybody's so excited. You stand poised on the edge of the greatest adventure of your life. So Moses decides to remind them of God's promises. And he gives them instructions before he leaves earth, his final words. And now, O Israel, listen to the statutes and the rules that I'm teaching you and do them that you may live. Now I'm about to read you a long section of scripture. I want you to understand something. Moses is not just talking to the Jewish people. He's talking to the generations to come, which includes us. The same truths that were true for them are true for us. Listen to the statutes and rules that I'm teaching you and do them that you may live and go in and take possession of the land that the Lord, the God of your fathers, is giving you. You shall not add to the word that I command you, nor take from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you. Keep them and do them, for that will be your wisdom and your understanding inside of the peoples who, when they hear all these statutes, will say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. And if you faithfully obey the voice of the Lord your God, being careful to do all his commandments that I command you today, the Lord your God will set you high above the nations of the earth. And all the blessings shall come upon you and overtake you if you obey the voice of the Lord your God. Blessed shall you be in the city, blessed shall you be in the field. Blessed shall be the fruit of your womb and the fruit of your ground and the fruit of your cattle, the increase of your herds and the young of your flock. Blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Blessed shall you be when you come in and blessed shall you be when you go out. The Lord will cause your enemies to rise against you to be defeated before you. They shall come out against you one way and flee before you seven ways. The Lord will command the blessing on you in your barns and in all that you undertake, and he will bless you in the land the Lord God is giving you. The Lord will establish you as a people today to himself, as he has sworn to you, if you keep the commandment of the Lord your God and walk in his ways. And all the people of the earth will see that you are called by the name of the Lord, and they shall be afraid of you. The Lord will open to you his good treasury, the heavens, to give you rain to your land in its seasons and to bless all the work of your hands. And you shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. And the Lord will make you head and not the tail, and you shall go up and not down if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today, be careful to do them. And if you do not turn aside from any of the words that I command you today to the right hand or to the left to go after other gods or to serve them. This sounds great, doesn't it? I mean, Moses, dude, this is going to be fantastic. Sorry, you're not going. All we have to do is obey the commands of the Lord and he promises blessings beyond belief. Who would not want to do what God is promising? 
It's a no-brainer. But just to be sure, Moses decides to give him the alternative. But if you will not obey the voice of the Lord your God, or be careful to do all his commandments and his statutes that I command you today, then all these curses shall come upon you and overtake you. Cursed shall you be in the city, and cursed shall you be in the field. Cursed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Cursed shall be the fruit of your womb and the fruit of your ground, the increase of your herds and the young of your flock. Cursed shall you be when you come in, and cursed shall you be when you go out. The Lord will send on you curses, confusion, and frustration in all that you undertake to do until you are destroyed and perish quickly on account of the evil of your deeds because you've forsaken me. The Lord will make the pestilence stick to you until he's consumed you off the land that you're entering to take possession of it. The Lord will strike you with wasting disease and with fever and inflammation and fiery heat and with drought and with blout and with mildew. They shall pursue you until you perish. The Lord will cause you to be defeated before your enemies. You shall go out one way against them and flee seven ways before them. And you shall be a horror to the kingdoms of the earth, and your dead body shall be food for all the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth, and there shall be no one to frighten them away. The Lord will strike you with madness and blindness and confusion of mind, and you shall grope at noonday as the blind grope in the darkness. And you shall not prosper in your ways, and you shall only be oppressed and robbed continually, and there shall be no one to help you. You shall betroth a wife, but another man shall ravish her. You'll build a house, but you won't dwell in it. You'll share, you shall plant a vineyard, but you shall not enjoy its fruit. Your sons and your daughters will be given to another people, while your eyes look on and fail with longing for them all day long, but you shall be helpless." The Lord will bring you and your king whom you set over you to a nation that neither you or your fathers have known. And there you shall serve other gods of wood and stone, and you shall become a horror, a proverb, and a byword among all the peoples where the Lord will lead you away. All these curses will come upon you and pursue you and overtake you till you are destroyed because you did not obey the voice of the Lord to keep his commandments and his statutes and all that he commanded you. They shall be a sign and a wonder against you and your offspring forever. Because you did not serve the Lord your God with joyfulness and gladness of heart, because of the abundance of all things, therefore you shall serve your enemies who the Lord will send against you in hunger and thirst and nakedness and lacking everything. And he'll put a yoke of iron on your neck until he has destroyed you. The Lord will bring a nation against you from far away, from the end of the earth, swooping down like an eagle, a nation whose language you do not understand, a hard-faced nation who shall not respect the old or shall mercy to the young. They shall besiege you in your towns until your high and fortified walls in which you trusted come down throughout the land. They shall besiege you in all your towns around all your land which the Lord your God has given you. And you shall eat the fruit of your womb, the flesh of your sons and daughters, whom the Lord God has given you, and in the siege and in distress in which your enemies will distress you. If you are not careful to do all the words of this law that are written in the book, that you may fear this glorious and awesome name, the Lord your God, then the Lord will bring on you and your offspring extraordinary afflictions, afflictions severe and lasting, and sicknesses grievous and lasting. And he'll bring upon you all the diseases of Egypt, of which you were afraid, and they shall cling to you. Every sickness also and every affliction that is not recorded in the book of this law, the Lord will bring upon you until you are destroyed. And the Lord will scatter you among the peoples from one end of the earth to the other. And there you'll serve other gods of wood and stone, which neither you nor your fathers have known. And among these nations you'll find no respite, for there shall be no resting place for the sole of your foot, but the Lord will give you a trembling heart and failing eyes and a languishing soul. You shall hang in doubt before you. Night and day you shall be in dread and have no assurance of your life. 
And when these things come upon you, the blessings and the curse which I have set before you, and you call to mind among all the nations where the Lord your God has driven you, and return to the Lord your God, you and your children, and obey his voice in all that I command you today, with all your heart, with all your soul, then the Lord will restore your fortunes and have mercy on you. And he will gather you again from all the peoples where the Lord your God has scattered you. And the Lord your God will bring you into the land your fathers possess that you may possess it. And he'll make you more prosperous and numerous than your fathers. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul that you may live. And the Lord your God will put these curses on your foes and enemies who persecute you. The Lord your God will make you abundantly prosperous in all the work of your hand, in the fruit of your womb, and in the fruit of your cattle, and the fruit of your ground. For the Lord again will take delight in prospering you as he took delight in your fathers. When you obey the voice of the Lord your God, to keep his commandments and his statutes that are written in the book of the law, then you will turn to the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. See, I've set before you today life and good or death and evil. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you today by loving the Lord your God, by walking in his ways and keeping his commandments and his statutes and his rules, then you shall live and multiply. And the Lord your God will bless you in the land you're entering to take possession of it. But if your heart turns away and you will not hear, but are drawn away to worship other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall surely perish. You shall not live long in the land you're going over the Jordan to enter and possess. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Therefore, choose life that you and your offspring, future generations may live. Loving the Lord your God, obeying his voice, holding fast for him, for he is your life and length of days that you may dwell in the land of the Lord, swore to your fathers Abraham and Isaac and Jacob to give to them. So Moses continued to speak these words to all of Israel and he said, I'm 120 years old. I'm no longer able to go out and come in. The Lord has said to me, you shall not go over this Jordan. The Lord your God himself will go over before you. He will destroy these nations before you so that you shall dispossess them. And Joshua will go over as your head as the Lord has spoken. Be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be in dread of them for it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Then Moses summoned Joshua and said to him in the sight of all Israel, Be strong and courageous, for you shall go with his people in the land the Lord has sworn to their fathers to give him, and you shall put them in possession of it. It is the Lord your God who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. Wow. Moses' final words to the people that he's been leading for 40 years. He tells them, Look, there's two choices. Even the bad choice, eventually God is going to accept back. But Moses, it's time to check out. Surely you'll leave the earth knowing that the people you poured your life into made the right choice. Who could hear that truth and not make the right choice? It's the no-brainer of all no-brainers. How could they not? It's so clear. Just obey what the Lord says and everything will be incredible. Moses, you can die in peace. You delivered the message. You may not be going with them, but they're surely going to do what God says. Moses could have died with all kinds of hope for the future. But look at what God does next. And the Lord appeared in the tent of pillar at the cloud, and the pillar of the cloud stood over the entrance of the tent. And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, you're about to lie down with your fathers. Then this people will rise and whore after foreign gods among them in the land that they're entering. And they will forsake me and break my covenant that I've made with them. Then my anger will be kindled against them in that day and I will forsake them and hide my face from them and they will be devoured. And many evils, troubles will come upon them so that they will say in that day, have not these evils come upon us because our God is not among us. And I will hide my face in that day because of all the evil that they've done because they've turned to other gods. 
Assemble to me the elders of your tribes and your officers that I may speak these words in their ears and call heaven and earth to witness against them. For I know that after my death you will surely act corruptly and turn aside from the way that I have commanded you. And all the days evil will befall you because the Lord will do what's evil in the sight of the Lord, provoking him to anger through the works of your hands. That very day, the Lord said to Moses, go up on the mountain of Abram, Mount Nebo, which is in the land of Moab, opposite Jericho, and view the land of Canaan, which I'm giving to the people of Israel as a possession, and die on the mountain which you go up and be gathered to your people. As Aaron, your brother, died in Mount Hor and was gathered to his people, because you broke faith with me in the midst of the people at the waters of Meribah Kadesh, in the wilderness of Zen, and because you did not treat me as holy in the midst of the people of Israel. For you shall see the land before you, but you shall not go there into the land that I'm giving to the people of Israel. And the Lord said to him, this is the land of which I swore to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob. I'll give it to your offspring. You shall see it with your own eyes, but you won't go there. So Moses, servant of the Lord, died in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. And he buried him in the valley of Moab opposite Beth Power. But no one knows the place of his burial to this day. Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eye was undimmed, his vigor unabated. We all think God doesn't keep his word. We think that we can talk him into grading on a curve. Moses couldn't do it. God made absolutely sure that Moses knew the mistake he made, the cost it would have, and what it would do to him. God keeps his promises both good and bad. Don't play chicken with God. Everything that God says would happen to them, happened to them. They intermarried in the Holy Land. They were led to embrace foreign gods. They forgot the commandment of God and pursued their own pleasures. Eventually, they were so rebellious that God allowed the Babylonians to besiege Jerusalem, and they were led away as slaves to a foreign land, Babylon. During the siege, things got so bad that just as God said, they ate their offspring, suffered terrible diseases and boils and death, and eventually God brought them back with Nehemiah back to the promised land, and he began to keep his promises. Just as he said, he restored them repetitively during the story of the Jewish nation. God kept his promises even though they didn't keep theirs. Moses died fully aware of his teaching. All his time with God, all his instructions and prayer for the Jewish nation would end in the promised land where he could not go but they would be rejecting God and doing the exact opposite of what Moses had begged them to do. Think how devastating that must have been at Moses' death. To have spent your whole life and feel that it's absolutely worthless. You see, we only see what we can see. We often evaluate our lives on our experiences during our life, and we forget that the impact of our life goes on for generations. Moses had no idea that we'd be studying about him today. Moses had no idea of the way he would impact the generations to come. When he died, he could see the promised land, but he couldn't go there. He couldn't enter. He's told by God that the people he spent his life shepherding would go astray and chase other gods and pay a deep price for their actions. The gentleman that paid for my grandfather's education had no idea what his act of generosity would do for my family. To my knowledge, when he died, my grandfather was barely in high school. That's why I constantly remind myself to try to live looking forward, not backwards. Realizing the things I do today are going to affect my grandchildren. The things this church does today is going to affect the faith and salvation of people who come to Sarasota a hundred years from now. I want to live my life present forward. In other words, I want to be in the present, but my mind needs to be on the things God's doing in the future. 
I don't want to spend my life not thinking about the eternal things to come and instead just looking at all the guilt and shame from my past. Have you ever noticed that Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph were all buried in the promised land or had their bones taken there? People could visit their graves. But Moses, look at this. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab according to the word of the Lord. And he buried him in the valley of the land of Moab opposite Beth Peor. But no one knows the place of his burial to this day. Who buried Moses? God did. Moses was buried in the land of Moab outside of the promised land. His burial site is unknown. That's odd, right? Remember, they carried bones from Egypt all the way back to the Holy Land to bury them there for Joseph and others. Do you remember when I talked about foreshadowing? How each of these men foreshadowed the life of the Messiah? Can you know where Jesus was buried? Can you visit his tomb? We think we can, but is he in it? God himself raised Jesus from the dead. To this day, no one's really sure where that tomb is. All we know is that on one day, Jesus will return to the promised land on the mountain and reveal his glory. Moses didn't get to enter the promised land with the Israelites, but he does enter the promised land. In fact, speaking for shadow, Moses returns to the promised land on top of a mountain and reveals the glory of God. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, and led them up on a high mountain by himself. And he was transfigured before him, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Moses gets to the promised land. Taken up by heaven, goes to God, returns to the promised land with Peter, James, and John. In fact, Peter thought this was the return of Christ, and he wanted to build booths for them in accordance with the scripture in the festival of booths. He didn't realize that what was happening was a foreshadowing of the future Messiah and the return of Christ. In that moment, the Old Testament prophet Moses, who would foretell of the Messiah to come, and Elijah and Jesus were all there to see Jesus' glory. The deliverer of Moses, the prophet Elijah, and the Messiah, the ultimate deliverer Jesus. Moses didn't know this moment of glory was going to come. That he would reach the promised land, that people would eventually be delivered, and all God's promises would come true. He didn't know what he didn't know. So what do we learn from Moses' life? You can't measure the impact of your life or your actions based on what you see and what you interpret. We have to live with eternity in mind. To do so, we're, if we don't live in the faith of eternity to come, then we're demanding that God constantly prove to us what he's doing. We carry our microwave expectations into an eternal long-term plan. You may never know why God brings you through a certain trial in your life or why he allowed a certain person in your life to die or why he's had you go through something that you prefer not to go through. You may not ever know why God is asking you to do something or why things happen the way they do. And we all misuse this passage. Let me read it to you. We know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. And that's absolutely true. Do you see a time frame on that promise? You see anywhere in that promise where he says, and it will happen in your lifetime and you'll see it and you'll understand what God's doing. No. He promises that what you go through for those who love God, eventually all of it works out for good. It may be on the other side of eternity, but it's going to work out for good. And he does not owe you an explanation. When we live in faith, we trust whatever God's doing. 
He'll use us, he'll use our lives for a greater purpose. Even if that purpose is generations from now. I honestly believe that I'm a doctor and a pastor because someone invested in the life of my grandfather generations ago. I'm a cross follower because somebody handed a precious seed of the gospel to my family generations before I came. I debated long and hard about whether or not to share this because Tammy and I, for the most part, kept this quiet. But as I prayed about this sermon, I think God wants me to show it to you. Six years ago, Tammy and I were on vacation in Tanzania. We met Freddie, our tour guide. It's funny, Tammy went up to him and said, are you ready, Freddie? And he said, how'd you know my name? It was really his name. We went out with him many days in a row and we bonded because the three of us loved Jesus. He told me about his faith and his family, how he had been a teacher before becoming a tour guide, how his wife was still a teacher. We learned that public schools in Tanzania were quite poor because everybody there was poor. Most of the kids were illiterate. He and his wife had dreams for their children to get an education, but private schools were incredibly expensive. His kids still had 12 years of school before college. They were just starting, and he had two of them. We spent days with him, and I felt God telling me that it was time to pay it forward. So for the past five years, Tammy and I have supported his two children through private school, Christian school, and have made a commitment to get them through college if they desire. They're in fourth and third grade now. What God started in a place called Hope, Arkansas, is now impacting two kids in Africa and their lives, and it'll have impact long after Tammy and I are gone. I'll never see what God's gonna do in Tanzania, but he's working out his plan and it's good, and I'm okay with that. I think one of the best things that we will experience in eternity is meeting all the people who impacted and were impacted by our lives. Moments God was orchestrating that we never, ever heard of. Moses died without seeing the promises of God fully fulfilled, but he had faith. He had faith that God would keep his promises. Even if Moses didn't get to see them in his lifetime, he knew God was faithful. You see, God's time frame is not limited to our life, our experience. But sometimes we try to force him into our microwave world. Why would our eternal God limit himself to our life experiences and expectations? Moses tells us to live with our minds set on the eternal, on the things God is doing that aren't seen. 2 Corinthians 4, 18, and we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. We live in an instant gratification world, but God tells us not to be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Part of that process is getting our expectations aligned with God's timing. We must constantly remind ourselves that God is not limited by our time on earth, and neither are we. We cannot be driven only by what we can see and understand. We cannot be limited in our lifetime's clock. We learn from Moses to live with eternity in mind and trust God with the eternal outcome of everything that happens. Live your life today as if the spiritual life of future generations depended on it, because they do. Let's pray. God, I thank you for your truth. I thank you that you love us, care for us, go ahead of us, provide for us, and you lay out for us the same choices that Moses did. Follow you and be blessed, resist you and be cursed. So simple. God, help us to live today with eternity in mind. Help us to look ahead. Help us to trust you with future generations that we will never see, but we know they're in your hands just as we are. 
Help us, God, to live beyond what we can see, beyond what we can experience, and help us go to that faith zone where you work and we stand in awe. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.